What fertility questions do you have? Today, I am answering your top fertility questions rapid fire and really quick. Hi friends, I am Dr. Natalie Crawford. I'm a board certified OBGYN and fertility doctor in Austin, Texas. And I asked a question box on my Instagram about if you had any fertility questions. And you guys had a lot of questions. I mean, so many questions that for National Infertility Awareness Week, I was trying to answer as many as I could, and there's just no way I could get to them all. So today, I just wanna take a moment. I have got my phone ready, and we are just going to rapid fire go through some of these questions so that I can give you the best information and answer as many as possible. What age generally do older women start needing help to get pregnant? I'm 36 elderly. Okay. I hate this term advanced maternal age. This does happen when you're age 35 and older, and it's due to an increase in chromosome abnormalities as we get older. I like to think about inside the egg. Imagine that your chromosomes are lined up in the middle and held apart by these little meiotic spindles. And so what happens is they split when you ovulate. And so the older you are, the longer they've been sitting there because they're this way since birth. And then they split and they have an increased tendency to have an abnormal splitting or an abnormal chromosome number because one gets pulled the opposite way and that's called aneuploidy and that causes miscarriage or failed implantation. As we approach 35, we start having about 50-50 of this happening and we start seeing a decrease in natural fertility rates and an increase in miscarriage all because of this phenomenon. This is also why for infertility, the definition of infertility is trying to get pregnant for one year without success if you're under age 35 or six months if you're 35 and older. And that's why 35 is such an important number for us. Number one, you should seek help right away if your periods are not regular. Regular cycles are essential in order to get pregnant in an efficient manner. Some women with irregular periods can get pregnant, but it's definitely not very efficient. And so seek help immediately if that's you. Fake news going around that being near someone who got the vaccine can change your period or cause you to have a miscarriage if you're pregnant. Even a slight possibility freaks me out. Oh my God, this is so crazy that there's even no hypothetical reason why this is happening. You can't shed a vaccine. I mean, you don't even, we don't even see this with a virus. You don't hear about, oh, I was around somebody who had COVID and then I miscarried. We do not see increased rates of miscarriage with COVID or with the COVID vaccine or infertility with COVID or with the vaccine. And we do have numbers of pregnant women getting the vaccine and we are getting that data. And we have studies looking at women who have gotten the vaccine and do not see any increase of infertility. What's the best treatment to get pregnant with anovulation? So this depends on a few different factors. Even though it's not wrong to just give you medication to make you ovulate, I'm a big believer that I like to evaluate everything. So I'm gonna recommend number one, that we check that your fallopian tubes are open and your uterus is normal. Number two, that you're not running out of eggs. Number three, that your partner has sperm. And number four, we know why you're not ovulating. Is it from your brain? Is it from your ovaries? Is it PCOS? Is it thyroid disease? Is it hyperlactin? Are you hypohypo? There's all these different causes of why you're not ovulating and the treatment depends on which cause you have. So if your brain is not sending out FSH or LH, I can't give you medications like Clomid and get your brain to respond. Your brain is not responding anyway. In that case, you would need hormone injections. If however you have PCOS and then your brain is sending out normal hormones but the ovary is not listening, I can use medications like Letrozole to tell the brain to send out more FSH and then that's the best option to get you to ovulate. So we really want to understand the cause and we want to have reasonable belief that ovulation induction will help you get pregnant. Mock cycle ERA biopsy, do you offer to all your patients? Yes and no. So a mock cycle is officially where you go through an entire fake frozen embryo transfer cycle. You watch how the lining's growing, you're giving all the medications, you just don't do a transfer. An ERA is done in a mock cycle and it stands for endometrial receptivity analysis. It is a biopsy where you sample part of the uterine lining to try to see which day it is most receptive. There's a lot of mixed literature out there and none of it supports using the ERA test in all patients before the first transfer. But I'm a believer in shared decision making and so I talk about it with all of my patients. Certainly I start entertaining this test if you've had failed euploid embryo transfers. Even then data is mixed, but I think it is an available test and something to consider. So what I usually do is have an honest talk about your goals, how many embryos we have. 
The downsides to the ERA is that the studies we have are limited. They best support doing the exact same cycle type that you do for the ERA, so it limits our protocol options. And it takes time and money and it's invasive. So it's going to add at least four to six weeks onto your treatment protocol. And a lot of people don't wanna wait for that, especially if they don't have any suspicion that something's wrong. So it's not a requirement for me, although I do talk about it with everybody, we will decide what makes the most sense for us. My doctor put me on birth control two packs to help regulate my cycle after a miscarriage. What do you think? This is complicated. So the reality is that one, you should always ask your doctor why. So maybe there's a reason that I don't know about. This is a text and we're not giving medical advice here. But studies support that you actually have increased fertility after a miscarriage. So I don't usually restrict my patients from trying to get pregnant just because they've had a miscarriage. That said, every situation is different. And maybe there was a procedure done. Maybe there was risk of an infection. Maybe the uterus needs to heal for some reason. And that's why a doctor would say that. But always ask your doctor. In general, we do not recommend that you have to wait a set amount of time after a miscarriage with the exception of an ectopic pregnancy when you receive methotrexate or if you had a procedure and some complication to your uterus and we feel like it's not ready to accept an implantation quite yet. Can you get pregnant naturally with submucosal fibroids? Is IUI or IVF even an option? Okay, fibroids. So a submucosal fibroid, well, let's back up. There are fibroids that can live in all different locations inside your uterus. There are fibroids on the outside of your uterus and that's subserosal. The serosa is the outermost covering of your uterus. There are intramural or intramuscular fibroids. Those are in the meaty part of your uterus, and those are the most common. And there's fibroids that are inside the uterus. Think of it as poking into the cavity called submucosal. We like those removed because we do think the ones that are inside the uterine cavity can contribute to infertility. Those are an easy procedure to remove them. So it's usually hysteroscopic, which is a camera through the cervix into the uterus. And then we resect out that fibroid depending on size and location. Sometimes we put a little balloon or a stent in the uterus afterward, and you take some estrogen to prevent scar tissue from forming. But if everything else is functioning, you can sometimes get pregnant after that. So just because you have one doesn't mean necessarily you have to do fertility treatments, but we do like fertility surgery for this reason. Realistically, what are the chances of pregnancy at 40 with a low AMH and IVF? Okay, this is a real question and I appreciate it. I can't give you a number, it totally depends. You should ask, what is my treatment protocol? How is this going to help me? What is the expected number of eggs I'm going to get? Of these eggs, how many do we expect to make it to embryos? Because there's natural loss throughout the process. For example, if you get 10 mature eggs, we would expect eight of them to fertilize, four of them to make it through to the blastocyst stage, and one of them to be genetically normal at age 40. That's not nothing. You can get pregnant with that one, but it's not a guarantee. I always counsel patients who are older and who have fewer eggs that it may take multiple cycles to get to the outcome you want to get. That's not impossible, but if it's a marathon, you deserve to know that it's a marathon from the very beginning and not be surprised by that later on. I also think it is really important to understand that this is an investment that has a short-term option where you can invest in, meaning if you choose not to do it now, your outcomes in two years are going to be drastically different. So having that low AMH being 40, that's like a fire under your feet. It's time to act or to be okay if it doesn't ever work and you don't get pregnant. It's a hard spot to be in. Find a dream you trust. Ask about your protocol so we're doing the best thing to get that expected egg number for you. Best way to deal with endo endometriosis before an FET, surgery or hormone suppression therapy? This is a really good question. So there's been a lot of debate out there. There was a great study which was recently published showing us that implantation rates were not lower for women who had endometriosis than women who did not. And so that for us is also telling us that for most women with endo, we don't have to go consider excision surgery before doing that transfer. We often can just use hormone suppression and lead into the transfer and still have the same outcomes as if you didn't have the disease. That's hugely important for us. So this study came out this year and I'm a fan of it. Left versus right ovary response during IVF symptoms. Do you know that the ovaries really respond differently? I always use that analogy, like there's a vault inside your ovary and that's where all your eggs live. The reality is each month you have a group of eggs comes out of the vault. One of them ovulates, the rest of them die. Next month, new group. Each ovary has its own vault. You're born with different amounts of eggs and you can get really different numbers from each one. In addition, if one of your ovaries has had a procedure done in the past, like surgery, you're probably going to get less eggs out of that one than you would otherwise. Okay, friends, hope you enjoyed Fertility Q&A. If you have questions that you want answered, feel free to leave them in the comments and I'm answering more questions live on Friday. That's 